In the Grand Hall of the Norman capital Rouen, the freshly titled Duke Robert II assembled his father's court to begin building a new order within the duchy. Unlike his court in Maine, the High Norman court was filled with the finest mines and sword arms the realm had to offer. Men and women of the most stately and talented breeds surrounded the young duke, and in the light of their achievements and ambitions, his meager flame was obscured. Yes, an able court was a dangerous thing for a ruler whose authority was mostly imagined, and indeed it was no exception here. The most powerful in Normandy disdained the new duke. From the brilliance of William, the man who wore his title of bastard with pride, for it only made his successes stand out more clearly, to the wilting boar Robert, not so proud as to not scream in court when his will was not fully attended to by any and all present. The officials of Normandy lamented their dire fortune. The most common complaint was that Robert held three counties in his own name, with the aptitude to manage merely one being well demonstrated to have left his bloodline at some point during conception. All demanded that Robert create new counts to manage his realm. He was eventually forced to agree to raise his youngest brother William to this rank, a shrewd insurance policy from the courtiers, for with that both of Robert's brothers had armies to their name, who might just nudge the rudder of history given the chance. Robert did not consider it that way. Instead, he delighted in giving William the county of Vendôme, so that it might be obvious to all that he, in his much larger county next door, was the bigger man. His rarely empty mouth had achieved a similar goal. After also promoting one of the leading Norman generals to the rank of baron, people stopped bothering Robert so much about it, and he tuned out the background whining with practiced ease. In early 1081, there happened to be a war afoot for France, as King Philip saw fit to contest a Mediterranean island held by the Amerid Emirate. They weren't Catholic, so they were fair game. Most of the Norman nobility were eager to further their reputation as the foremost warriors in France, and camped under the King's banner along the coast, ready to sail off to glory. Robert wasn't the sort for sailing off to glory though. He needed his men for when he decided to upstage his father and successfully conquer England, which he presumed would be possible once the rest of his duchy's men returned from their pointless escapade. Thus, he settled in for a quiet summer in French high society, enjoying the absence of all the more popular dukes. In May, a plan-ruining turn of fortune reared its familiar head. In response to the French king's threats, the Amerids had sent an army to raid France itself. Their first target? Normandy. The Norman army was still in the area, but General Raoul and King Philip both agreed that Robert could deal with this invasion, leaving the French invasion force to go pillage the presumably unguarded enemy realm. Somehow, as usual, Robert's plan had backfired with precision that could only be the work of the very same god who supposedly ordained the war in the first place. Robert's summer was thus spent visiting his vassals and asking them to contribute troops for his new task. His younger brothers were the least enthusiastic to help, and considering the groans and sighs of the other landowners, that's saying something. Fortunately, the Amerids were hopelessly lost in the strange land they had been sent to, and didn't wander far from Evreux where they had first landed. So, even though it took all summer to muster, Robert's army was able to meet the Amerids in battle before too much of the realm was discomfited by their foreign appearance. Not to mention their pillaging ways sufficient to shock even these descendants of Vikings. The battle was thankfully not conducted with Robert's supervision, meaning the old Duke's experienced officers could try some actual strategy. They used a tactic new to them but considered old hat a thousand years prior, an oblique order formation with most of the army clumped up on the left to guarantee victory on one flank. 
the French centre fled the battle quickly to avoid the strength of the more traditionally deep Amarid centre. This led said centre away from the flanks. The French left struck and the Amarid right was flattened by a force ten times its size. Then all the French needed to do was wheel around to attack their foe's main group from behind and the battle was good as won. Around 800 Amarids were killed in the action, and while the rest escaped before nightfall, they were only running into the French countryside, a land in which they were heathens to be killed, or worse, without mercy by any they met. Robert was quick to report the victory to King Philip, who was most pleased with the Duke's very patriotic account of events. Robert learned that the French army in the Mediterranean was stuck making a boring siege. The glory and honour of victory in battle were so far entirely to be enjoyed by the Normans and by him. Knowing that another battle would be needed to finish the coalescing Amarid horde off, Robert decided to send away from the army all the companies belonging to his vassals. This ensured his personal army would strike the killing blow and receive the lion's share of the credit for winning this holy war. As usual, Robert was thinking only of his own position and advancement, but in truth, sending the high morale troops of his angry vassals home gave his enemies in court great power. In fact, two powerful men approached William, the recently appointed Count of Vendôme, to begin convincing him that he should seize the duchy from Robert by force. The names of these men? Confusingly, Robert and William. But suffice to say, they were powerful men, with the latter being Duke Robert's military marshal, responsible for the training of soldiers. With these figures ready to stand against him if a banner was raised, Robert's position was extremely precarious. Robert's own men continued their march for glory, finding the Amorids again across the border in the Holy Roman Empire, and defeating them again with precisely the same strategy that had worked before. Perhaps it was the last thing their commander expected, if he was experienced in strategic matters. These troops then marched towards home, planning to stop at Paris to pay respects to the king and have their efforts lavishly rewarded with parades, prizes and all manner of honours both spiritual and carnal. Instead, they found the city going about its business, with the news being that the war had ended some time ago after some deal was struck in a faraway palace. Turned out the Duke never did get around to sending that letter to his army to explain it all. He must have been distracted by the increasing alarm he felt when he reviewed again and again the report on just how many troops in his realm had pledged to support William if he wished to rebel. His eventual response to this threat was something that can only sit on the hinge between disastrous and genius. He made the ringleader of the plot against him, William of O, the spymaster of Normandy. It was like handing your worst enemy a sword and turning your back. What could he have been thinking? You must understand that Robert was no pragmatist. Killing William of O in secret would solve his issue. But there was a far more fascinating solution. The new spymaster was to be kept sufficiently busy that he could not effectively plot with his co-conspirators. The business he would conduct was the gathering of a band of men, told only that they were being hired for the purposes of killing a known traitor within the Norman court. Several men were happy to join the plot, eager to await Robert's indication of who their target was. Each bead of sweat on Spymaster William's head was another victory in Robert's brutal psychological campaign. Only William knew who the traitor was, but as Spymaster he could not flee, nor could he not carry out his liege's scheme to prepare the weapons and methods for his own murder. As it happened, Robert caught wind of another plot in his realm. Some scorned lover of one of his generals, Robert de Conteville, was planning the ultimate revenge. Spymaster William, so the tavern rumour said, was going to lead the general to the quiet spot where one Madame Avis would enact justice by dagger point. 
Wishing to preserve his retainer, Robert sent a snidely worded letter to William, informing him that the plot was to end at once, for now the Duke needed only to utter the secret phrase in court and point at the spymaster to have a band of willing executioners appear from the shadows. While William could have played along to prolong his life, it was clear to him that Robert intended simply to toy with his prey. He was fully enveloped in the Duke's trap, doomed to be dominated in any way the cackling man-child saw fit, until the fun was exhausted and death was all that remained. The only recourse was to fight his way out. Surprising the whole realm, he declared publicly that not only would he continue his attempts to murder the enemy of the friendly girl who had given him such a nice time in the gardens that one night, but he was also going to kill the Duke of Normandy, for reasons he wished to remain private. It seemed that he had snapped, which was dire news for his 700 personal troops, now forced to fight the rest of the Norman army, numbering five times that. The manic spymaster had surprise on his side, but nothing else. He was beset from all corners by foes, and forced to watch as Norman slew Norman in the hidden name of his foolish scheming. His defeat would remove one of Robert's strongest political enemies from the equation, and cast him as a madman of the highest order. It was the sweetest victory that could have come from Robert's crafty manipulations. Master of the gloat, Robert held his royal wedding in ruin as the fighting continued. Mare Stenkel's daughter, sister to the reigning King of Sweden, joined the Duke, dressed as a king, beneath the beautiful stained glass of a holy cathedral. Their dazzling attire shone out to attract the eyes of all to their otherwise well-matchedly plain appearances. Robert's international fame was established, as guests from the high courts of neighbouring kingdoms arrived to witness the union, and hear the well-paid bards tales of Robert's valour and cunning. One visitor to the affair was none other than Robert de Conteville, the military leader whose womanising ways had stirred up the waters in precisely the way needed for Robert of Maine to reach safe port. The Duke introduced the general to his younger sister Agatha, and the pair were soon nowhere to be seen at the matrimonial festivities. That was not the end of that little tale, for a week later, Robert happened upon Agatha in the castle kitchen, sitting beside one Avis de Clare, the mastermind to the plot to kill de Conteville. It seemed that both of them had taken deep offence to the lies de Conteville had told them in order to elicit various services, and now they were equally set upon killing the man. Robert, eager to win the support of his sister in a family one waving banner away from total war, decided to join in on the murder party. After all, getting rid of that general was somewhat neat in the literally grand scheme of things. Alongside that project, he was keeping an eye on his army, which was starving out the last men loyal to William of O. Upon their success, William was presented to the Duke in chains, who had that traitor sent to rot in the dungeon. Could anything make this victory even better? Evidently yes. At the same time, the King of France decided that Robert's enemy, Folk of Anjou, was sufficiently unpopular that the crown could probably steal the county of Tours without much resentment. Far from resentment, Robert felt only joy. He was happy to send his men to humiliate his neighbour, and of course he wanted to please his king as much as he could, for one good turn deserves another. Furthermore, if the king managed to scatter Folk's armies, perhaps Robert's long-term goal of annexing Anjou into Normandy would be realised. Robert was first into his armour now. Suddenly, war didn't seem so boring anymore.